Hi, welcome to Thinking Green. We're on the air. <laughs> and we are taping today, so it is not a live show. You can't call in, but uh, it should be interesting. Uh, I'm happy to welcome Lena, uh, okay, Agudelo, right? Very good, perfect. Okay, uh, <laughs> as guest, and, and she's the executive director of Hispanic Alliance of Southeast Connecticut, which is an organization that's been in, in New London for about 20 years now. Yes. So welcome, Lena. And I guess I'll start out, we'll talk mostly about the organization, but the first five minutes, I'm going to ask you how you became involved with uh, Hispanic Alliance and what your experience has been so far. So um, thank you very much, Rana, for having us here. Um, I really ap appreciate this, this space and your time. Um, I have been, um, I, I knew about the Hispanic Alliance, and I, le I learned about the Hispanic Alliance um, from its founder, Alejandro Melendez, Melendez Cooper, about 20 right. years ago, um, being part of the community, the local community, the New London community. My family was looking into starting a new business and right on Bank Street, actually. And um, oh. we, um, we met, and he was a great resource for information. He was a great guidance in, the pro in, in many processes for us, to be very honest with you. He actually was... Um, he, he, he was the Hispanic Alliance, and he did exactly what his mission and his vision was, which was to empower you know, Latinos or Hispanic, the Hispanic community and offer those resources, be a bridge you know, between the, the community and the resources and connect um, all of us. And that's exactly how, what, what he did um, now for, for many, many members of the community. Um, Throughout the years, we stayed in contact. You know, I've stayed in the community. I've worked in the community, and um, when um, when this opportunity came up, that, that's when I, I, you know, I said, well, maybe this is my time. You know, this is a, this would be a great opportunity to give back. Somehow, so much that has been received. So, how long have you been at Hispanic Alliance now? Yeah, it's been a short time. It's been six months. Oh, okay, <laughs> that's it. <laughs> at, at this role, at this role, as the right. Executive Although you've director. been aware of it, and oh interacting yeah, and I've been involved, with it for a long and time. I had many coffees, many lunches with Alejandro. We talked and shared ideas about our community and how it had changed throughout the years, and its diversity, and the many needs, and the many, the many gaps that needed to be filled, right, um, based on our own experiences. So, and the people we we, we kind of came across in life, right. So. Um, there were many conversations and many, many, um, brain, a lot of brainstorming around what, you know, the Hispanic Alliance could contribute and do. So, yeah, I, has, I have always been a part of the organization itself, but more as a community member. Now, when you talk about the community, I, I think maybe a lot of people don't realize the incredible diversity within the community you serve. You know, some people think, oh, you know, they're... It's a big Puerto Rican community yeah. in New London, and you know that's all that's really on their radar screen. But I think one of the purposes to start with with Hispanic Alliance was to highlight that diversity. It's, yeah, that it is a much more diverse community than yeah. that. Um, you know, in New London, there are. I, don't, I worked for Head Start, and I had families. You know, Peruvian families, mm -hmm. Salvadorian families, uh, Ecuadorian families. Um, so, you know, I was kind of aware of how many places people came from. Mm -hmm. But I don't know that most of, of the people in New London were really quite that aware of it 20 years ago. 
No, and um, it's, it's really interesting you, you bring that up. It's, so I came um, to New London about 20 years ago, or a little more than that, about 22 years ago. And when, when I first came, it didn't seem like there were that many of us, right? It was very, it, it, and, and, and it seemed like the groups were very, um, very small groups of different or very diverse communities, right? Now, the Hispanic communities um, are a diversity, includes ethnicity and racial, right? But in addition to that, culture, even our own language, Spanish, we, we all speak Spanish, and yes, we are all very much capable of understanding each other, right? <laughs> but there are, we have different ways of expressing, and we have different tones and accents, and culturally, we're very diverse. I think also that the way we immigrate to the United States also shapes a lot our experience here and also our possibilities, right? So you also find that sometimes communities um, based on that have certain behaviors, attitudes, or you know, have uh, different opportunities based on their immigration experience. So there is a lot within our community that's very diverse and it's very interesting. And, and having in a space a group of individuals, Hispanics from different countries such as, like you were saying, um, Dominican Republic, Puerto Rico, Peru, Ecuador, Colombia, Venezuela, Argentina, I mean, you, Mexico, um, you, you are, you're seeing this in Central America, all these countries from Central America. There's so much diversity, there's so much, there's a lot, there's a lot of um, differences, but there's also a lot of things that bring us together and that we share, our history, one, right? Our heritage, sure. um, our indigenous heritage, um, our goals, our dreams, when we come to this country and what we leave behind, right? So a lot of those feelings and experiences are common, right? And that's where we, that's where we can come together. That's what really brings us together. So, so, so it does seem as though it's, it's one of the few places in New London that really does allow the common ground to, you know, kind of take over. That is our mission. Yes. Yeah. To bring a community and, and build community, right? build that um, idea of community. Um, because I think many times, and, and I felt it myself as, as a, um, an, an immigrant, um, that there's a loss of belonging. As that sense of belonging, you lose that when, when, you, when you first come to the, the United States. And that's really, it, it, it's a process. And, um, and I think that um, if you, when, you are, when you find a space where you're able to connect with other individuals who have a shared experience, even if you know we see all these differences, but at the end of the day we see each other. Okay, we are Hispanic, right? And then you know, or we are immigrants. Or we, so that's where we feel where we find that sense of belonging at that moment. And then as time progresses, and with the support of the community, and we, we start to assimilate, and then you know, and, and then build a larger sense of belonging, you know, to the larger community and. And that's exactly what happened to me, right? In the beginning, I really <laughs> felt like I was a foreigner, like I was from the outside, right? But throughout time and by, you know, with the support of the Hispanic Alliance and by meeting so many different wonderful humans, you know, I was able to, you know, create connections and start to build that sense of belonging again. And that's really important for any human being, right? To really feel like they belong to a space, a place, a community. Well, and, and I'm thinking the first awareness I think I had of Hispanic Alliance was like, you know, youth scholarship programs. Yes. And uh, if you look at the student population in New London schools, there is a very large and diverse Hispanic population. Okay. So it, I guess uh, my question is, so I'm thinking you have a history of really working with youth. Yes. and. I'm wondering what you're doing now. So right now, we currently have our scholarship program, which um, opened at the beginning, of the end of December, beginning, and will be the deadline is now March 15th. So we have reached out to all the southeastern Connecticut high schools, especially more specifically local high school, to um, offer, um, create awareness, bring awareness of the scholarship opportunity. In addition to that, to offer support to the families and the youth. We understand that one of the learning processes um, when, you, when, you, when you first come to 
um, the United States is to learn to understand the system itself and um, you know families households have certain priorities which is working and you know and the kids go to school and yes they they you know you sometimes you would think well these kids are going to school and have been going to school here for years they should already know they've been listening to this process for so long they should know what they have to do well not not really um, there is there's a, a lot of bureaucracy there is a lot of all bureaucracy. of us have a hard time with. and I think yes I think it's a shared feeling that <laughs> I think everyone has a very difficult time but when you have a language right and when you have access as the barriers it, it really it really will um, it, it really becomes a huge obstacle for many families to access the resource I believe I truly believe that it's really not a lack of resources resources there's many it's just really the access to those resources to make sure that everyone has equal access to these resources that's really what we want to do we want to empower these households these parents and these youth and, and say to them you know we can walk you through this process we have made this process very simple well to our eyes right but as as, as possible but then let us support you in that process of applying right and then we are open to conversations okay what is stopping you for from applying and how can we support you and that's really what we try to do we have conversations I um, I, I was able to go to um, we went to NFA and we had a conversation with the youth there and we presented it was actually very successful we had a lot of youth applying from there and um, we opened um, New York Lemon High School I know um, we'll have an event this Saturday but um, we have opened Wednesday next week this coming week two days to offer assistance to these parents. All you have to do is sign up on our website for the assistance and we will make ourselves available during, um, between 3 p.m. and 5.30 p.m. And we'll support them in the, in the application process just to, you know, we try to be as flexible as we can to ensure that they all apply. It's a learning process for everyone. You'll find mm -hmm. that a lot of people might not be eligible for FOSPA for different reasons, but um, have their savings and really, you know, their children have everything um, to, to get one of these scholarships, right? To be awarded one of these scholarships. So um, we want to make sure that everyone applies. Yeah, well, I do remember, my own kids are old now. They're in their late 40s, early 50s. But I remember I, even someone who grew up here and went to public schools in the US, the FAFSA forms were awful. <laughs> they were, I, they're tricky. <laughs> they were terrible, and they were so much worse than like doing like income tax forms are awful. But the FAFSA was even, it was even worse. It it, it was just terrible. And I think also that, you know, the technology piece, it's really can be very complicated, tricky, right, and complicated. I I think it's intimidating. I think that. You know, when you're going onto an application or a website and you're completing an application, right? And then you run into these this this um, roadblocks where it's not letting you go because you continue or move forward because there is a an upload issue or, you know, whatever that may. It, that can stop a lot of people from continuing the process, and it can become very frustrating because you don't have a person to speak to. This could be as simple as just let's bring all the paperwork and here it is, right? Right. Why can't we just do well? You know, unfortunately, we can't just do that. It has to go on a, on a, on a platform. It, there has to be a, a process, but it can be frustrating, um, time-consuming, very time-consuming. And again, I think that also these type of processes will also kind of affect the parents. Um, if they don't have the information or if they don't have the knowledge to support their child in the application, there might be some feeling of loss of um, empowerment. So what we try to do is avoid that. We try to make it, you know, it's, it could be complicated for anyone, really. It has, it really, it, it's just a difficult process itself, right? And that's what we're here to do, to support you through that process, to make it as easy as possible and as doable as possible. Yeah, things seem like they're getting a little better in this country, maybe, but, you know, language barrier is really, yeah. It's really hard because, you know, in the United States, I've lived outside of the country and learned that throughout the world, there are very few places where people only know one language. Yes. yes. But the United States, not only do a lot of people know only one language, but they sort of look down on people who are bilingual 
or speak other languages. Or speak other languages and and other languages, you know, are, are, are more comfortable for them than English. And yet bilingualism or multilingualism is kind of the norm worldwide. worldwide we don't yeah, accommodate it, it very well. And it's, it's interesting you say that because you may go to other countries where when you hear a different language, it's actually something people admire, right? And, and, and look yeah. up to, right? Oh, wow. You know, and it, create, yeah. and it creates curiosity. I, I have, when I think about um, the language barrier, it, I do understand that it's important to learn the language and we do, um, that is a message we, we, we give our, our community. It is really important because it's part of the assimilation process. And, and um, you know, we, it allows you to, it opens up a lot of doors sure. and it, it allows you to walk that road you're walking, you know, with just so much more confidence, right? So sure. it gives confidence, it offers confidence. Um, one of the things that maybe it, I think what we try to do is kind of eliminate those ideas, preconceived ideas that because I am older, I can't, or because of, and there's a lot of shame many times, oh, I'm, I speak with an accent, I speak with an accent. English is my second language, mm -hmm. but you know, I have come across so many wonderful people in my lifetime here that I've never felt as it l looked down because of this accent, or I truly haven't. I've actually, and, and, but, but I am humble about it, and I do say, you know, I, how do you say that word? And you'll find oh. me, you'll find many times that I will say the wrong word, or I will use it in the wrong, you know, tense, or, but I try my best not to, right? But, um, but there are many ways for you to learn the language. The other day I had, I was speaking to a community member, and she is bright a bright woman, someone to admire, truly admire, an entrepreneur, doesn't have, um, didn't have an opportunity to finish, not even second grade elementary school. But she reads, she writes, she knows her math, she has a business, a very successful business here. Let me say that. And um, I, she said, Lena, how do I learn English? I want to become a U.S. citizen, but what do I do? And I said, well, there is adult education, but what I, what they, they offer me, I already know that. I want to learn English at a higher level. So go to Three Rivers, register yourself, but I never finished high school. And to be able to complete my GED, they say they need to speak English. How do I That's do That's a prerequisite. Yes. So how do Not I do this? Yeah. That is interesting. Well, how are you going? Yes. Yeah, so how? Yes. How are you going to complete your GED if you don't speak the language? I guess I don't know how much of that has been a a actual um, reason for her not to be able to do it. I mean, I don't know if there's systematically if that's yeah. a barrier. I don't know, but I do know that um, for her in her mind it is, and maybe she has she's received that message. And I, um, I said, well, you know, then you're gonna have to do it on your own. And how do I do this on my own? You gotta go out there. You gotta read. You gotta, you, and you can do it. You can definitely do it. So a lot of this is about empowerment. And one of our programs that we have is La Latina Network and Brilla. La Latina Network is a program that is focused on empowering women, networking and offering networking opportunities and empowering women. And this is done through an opportunity to meet other women that um, you might find something in common with, right? Um, the majority of these um, reunions are in, in Spanish. All of them are in Spanish, but some may speak, be bilingual and speak both languages. So you will see a lot of coming back and forth between languages. We're just focusing on one language to the com for the comfort of everybody else. Um, one. Um, one of the things Hispanic Alliance does is we partner with other um, sectors, other organizations. And um, Citizens Bank is one who will um, come to us and offer workshops where we educate our community and we offer information, right? Information that will open up all those, it will open up, will give them access to the resources, direct access. So that's really um, what we do through La Latina Network. It's, it's, we found that it really is, it's very contributing, it's very beneficial for these community members that participate in it. Um, we allow them to des design the topics of the conversations they want to be exposed to, be a part of. 
so which is great because that's how we learn what the needs are and the wants are that's what we do um, and we've found that many times applying for a citizenship is one of those big goals those ultimate goals the language is a barrier so um, we're looking into trying to find resources that will connect them to if it's not tutors, it's some you know someone or a program that will offer that opportunity to learn the language. Now, if someone's watching this show and they know someone who might really benefit from this uh, Latina Network uh, program, how do they get in touch with you? How would they sign? You have to sign up ahead of time, or yes. what's the process? So what we do is for all of our programs, we ask our communities to go on our website. And, reg and just sent an email um, requesting information about a specific program. Some of our programs do require registration, um, and others you just have to express your interest in, be interest in being a part of it. And then one of our program's coordinators will reach out and you know invite them to the event. And so yes, it's open to everybody, and we welcome anyone that believes they want to be a part of, of this group. Now, how often does this Latina network work meet? twice a month we meet twice a month they meet twice a month on Wednesdays um, after um, five o'clock um, for about an hour and it's created a kind of like a sisterhood <laughs> it really does I, I sometimes when I I'll walk in sometimes or you know and, and 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 I see that connection that has been you know that the sisterhood it's a sense of sisterhood and a lot of it um, one of their meetings it's really open conversations about anything anything that's going on that might be affecting. And then there's, you know, it's, it's also, it, it really does support also, um, it, it offers a space to vent and share experiences, learn from others. We have people from many different ages, different countries, different experiences here. You know, some are married, some are single parents, some are single young women that don't have any children. Are, so we have seniors, so we do have a very diverse group. Well, that sounds great. Um, let's see, what other programs have you developed over the last, you know, five or ten years in response to uh, a community need that came up? So, what um, during one of these conversations with La Latina Network, um, there was a um, Brida was developed. Brida is a program that's focused on empowering youth um, every year. During the summer, there is a one-week program where 15 um, rising juniors are exposed to different industries. Um, we have partners such as Pfizer, Electric Boat. We have different colleges that will come in and um, bring mentors or individuals that are in, in those specific fields and identify with the girls in, these, in this group, ethnically, racially, Gender-wise, I mean, there is a, there will be something in common that the girls can see themselves reflected on, right? It's kind of like, and um, it's a great opportunity because it exposes these girls to many times possibilities that they can't even consider for themselves. You know, they're seeing this um, wonderful um, woman who is a um, engineer at Electric Boat and has reached all of these has goals and she was also the daughter yeah first generation college and she is um, her parents immigrated 20 years ago and you know so so they see all these share experiences and all these things oh my god well i that that sounds like my story and this is where she is she made these choices and that's where she is today maybe i can make similar choices and i can i can i can i, I can make a dream a dream a little bigger right so really what it does is it gives them that opportunity. Um, some of our goals with this program is to, like I said, expose, offer an experience that is going to open up, uh, you know, what this world looks like. I think that with COVID and, you know, post-COVID, a lot of our youth lost, missed out on so much that um, this program, um, you know, 
during COVID, we weren't able to do it in person. It was done virtually, but we see the difference and in, 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 in the, the effects of it when it was done in person last year. It was just wonderful. So I think that it really is a great opportunity for these girls to come into a space where they see faces that many of them, they didn't even know each other or they went to the same school, but never even crossed each other and for different reasons. Cause and and here they find they, they realize that we're not so different you know there's we, we do have a lot more in common um to others than, than we think and we imagine and our experience is not so unique but we do share experiences and we can learn from the other person right it doesn't mean it, 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 there is no loss in that process right so um it, it's a great opportunity for them what's also great about it is that they they do create and they're also able to build a network right with mentors, people that are already in these fields. And we found that after this workshop this week, um, we have connected with them through the arts and culture, which is another one of our programs, and I'm gonna jump into that program. Yeah. In that program, um, we promote our, um, we share our heritage through the arts and culture. Um, we have a gallery right on State Street, on 170 State Street. And we right, uh, right now we are working on creating a calendar for this year where we are hoping to um, expose um, diverse Hispanic artists. Um, we're looking t for diversity in the arts too. So um, it could be whatever, right? Um, and we are looking to present our history, our heritage through these arts our culture, to share our culture, because that's really what, one of our missions, to share our culture. And one of the special things about these um, art, um, uh, th this, this relationship we build, with, we build with the artists is that they also offer a workshop for our community. And it's free of charge, we, you know, and um, these girls from these programs also participate, La Latina Network participates, so we connect all of our programs. Right, there's a connection between all of them, and they participate from this experience, which is wonderful. Um, it's a conversation with the artist, in addition to learn, learning a skill, learning some kind of, you know, I don't know, a skill. So that, that's how that that's the arts and culture program. Now, is that a relatively new program that there's a gallery and a lot of emphasis on the arts? No, actually, it, had, it was a part of the it was a part of the vision of the Hispanic Alliance. Um, Alejandro um, was also an artist. Um, I believe there was a, a, actually a gallery when the, in, in another um, location um, before COVID, prior to COVID. Um, I think that um, with COVID, we had to stop a lot of our in-person um, sharing and um, COVID made us, um, well, one of the goals or what, one of our missions is to um, meet our community's needs, right? And as these needs change, um, so do our our programs and what we have to offer, right? I mean, we can't stay fixed right. on one mission and one 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 line of programs when the community has this other very obvious needs. And COVID created very obvious needs. We all know that. Yeah, and, <laughs> nothing, and it was nothing that we anticipated. It at wasn't all. anticipated. So at organizations all. and individuals had to adapt really quickly to very quickly a very different world yes we did we had to um and and that was something that um the hispanic alliance did very well um being an organization that focused on promoting mentoring empowering and promoting the hispanic community through educational programs to the arts and the culture we realized that okay right now we have to um focus on the basic need right now our community has and at that moment um, there was a need for food there was a need for financial assistance for um, housing medical expenses I mean the needs were very clear and we were all all of us that were working out there we knew very clearly that these needs were um, high in some community higher in some communities than others right so um, our community definitely was very impacted highly impacted why you would ask well you know, a great part of our community works in, in areas such as construction, 
hotel industry, restaurant industry. Um, all I was these, thinking maybe elder care and child care as well, which child are really care. kind of exactly. frontline yes, workers. And they were frontline workers, but you found that a lot of these households lost income, right? And they, went, they had hardship, financial hardship. Um, also, there were cases where um, if the main provider, um, a single, fi uh, a single head, of a head of household, um, became ill because he was a yeah. frontline worker and he was out there working, or she was out there working with the community, providing care for the community. They were exposed to COVID. They became ill. Who was there to pay those bills? Right. So the reality was the impact of co it impacted everyone, right? But there were communities that were strongly impacted. And some of these communities did not have the resources, the access to certain resources, right, um, because of documentation, et cetera, which created a bigger and a higher um, a need, a higher need. So we created the Ajuda program. Um, we had Ajuda, in, in its beginnings, the Hispanic Alliance provided networking and referral services. That was part of our program, has always been a part of our programs. We, again, we, our, our focus is to ensure equal access, equal access to everything out there. Primarily healthcare, which has been one of our, uh, one of the Hispanic Alliance's um, missions. Um, due to Alejandro's background, being the um, director of the community health center right. for such a long time, healthcare was really one of his focuses. So information about healthcare conditions and, and, and mental health, um, chronic diseases, various. So there was a lot of alliances created with different organizations to provide this information and also access, access to the different resources that could be out there for to, to make sure that people have access to health care. So um, that's what really Ajuda was very much focused on. But with COVID, um, there was a bigger need <laughs> for connect, connecting to the resources. So and, and we learned a lot throughout the throughout this this process. We really did. Um, Ajuda broke down in two programs. We have the advocacy and referral services where our community um, members, um, what we do is we connect them to resources that may be available to them. Um, we have a great program coordinators who are very connected in the community, I know a lot of people, um, know what doors to knock, are very resourceful. Um, we've created great partners in the community, such as Almost Home, New London Homeless, New London Homeless Hospitality, TVCCA. I mean, everyone has been wonderful, and I think that that's one of the things COVID, that was one of the positives <laughs> about COVID, that within organizations, we've learned to work together. I think that it's really that, That's good. good. I worked you know, for TVCCA for years, in Head Start and in early yeah. childhood education, and yeah, sometimes in the past, maybe there was a sense a of, of competition it. among yeah. different organizations that kind of did overlapping S services. Similar services, but yeah. I'm glad to hear that there was at least one good consequence of COVID. I feel everyone. there was. I feel that, and there still is, and that actually has continued. I'm part of several different groups, which um, include many other agencies and organizations, and I'm pleased to say that it's very. It's a. It's very. It's a very. It's a positive relationship, it, and, and, and and just being able to share our experiences and and offer all of these resources to our community. I mean, at the end of the day, we are here to serve the community. That's really what we're here to do. So, the more resources we have at their um, disposition, the, the the better the service, right? Yeah. You know, um, the bigger the opportunity for them, right? So. Um, and then the other part of the program was um, our food pantry. Um, we started a food pantry. Um, it's a bit unique. It's a food pantry that runs during the evenings. It does require a registration because of the limited space. Sure. And um, it runs um, twice a month. And it's really, um, we have noticed, and, and I think this just, as you offer a service, the community itself starts kind of creating a certain um, pattern I mean, uh, there's um, a lot of them are working families, so they only have access to they, they only have access to a pantry after work hours, and there aren't really. Uh, I'm not sure if there yeah. are any other food pantries running after that time, um, but we do, and um, it's not exclusive to Hispanic community. 
We have a very diverse group of people that come to us. But yes, um, the fact that we are the Hispanic Alliance does um, offer a sense of trust and you know opens up the door for Hispanics to be our primary um, yeah. community that's being served. So yes, so h how do people, is that another situation that people should just go onto your website and if they want to participate, they can contact you and get more information? Yes, so for the food pantry, and, 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 it, and, and it does have to be through a registration process, this is because of the limited amount of meals we have, right? We, unfortunately, the space does not allow us to provide more, and yeah. the timing to right? The time frame is shorter. Right. So, um, like I said, this is this runs, um, we begin, the, 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 the pantry really starts working very early, but um, it's a partnership with OIC, and, and they're wonderful. The volunteers are just wonderful, and we are very grateful and appreciate everything um, they do because it, they, they, it's just wonderful, to be honest with you. So they work very hard. We also have great interns from Connecticut College that come in, are coming in and participating. And um, they participate from, from the beginning, which is putting together the boxes, up to you know checking down the list of the members that are coming in to pick up. So yes, there is a registration process. Yes, uh, there is a limited number of registrations we can accept in a given day. And, um, but what we do try to do is to ensure that more people have access to it, and we do this by, um, if we see that it's a very frequent family, you know, we try to give prior, you know, also opportunity right. for others, right? And we do have a waiting list, and um, our program coordinator, she's wonderful, and she'll start calling people, <laughs> oh my God, we have more boxes left, can you come in? And she'll stay sometimes till later to make sure they, they, they can pick up their, their, their box. So it's great, it really is great. That sounds great. It's a great program, it really is. Now I want to go back a little bit to the arts and culture because when I looked on your website, you did have some things that, um, like art therapy kinds of programs and public art ki kinds of things that I was just gonna ask you about. Yes, yeah, so Imagine Public Arts, that's really the program we were talking about um, I was talking about earlier, which is at the gallery, we have, um, we expose different artists, right? Um, Connecticut artists. Um, of course, yes, if we have local artists, we will definitely make them our priority. Um, but I, we currently actually have a local artist, I believe, who we are looking into a conversation because oh, it's wonderful art. Oh my God, yes, beautiful art, beautiful, beautiful work. Um, the the workshops that I was also talking about are very much geared towards they're very th um, they offer a therapy opportunity right um, there's a conversation with the with the artist where it's more it, it's more a back and forth conversation right about experiences um, which we, we know the arts the art, arts are a great um, way for us to express and relieve a lot of our you know emotions and feelings so it's it's there's definitely a therapy when it comes to creating art and the idea is for whoever comes to these workshops they don't have to feel like they have to have they, they need a skill or yeah. prior knowledge or anything because it's not focused on creating the art itself it's really very much focused on the experience of meeting an artist talking about their experience their own experience and learning something right and as and as this conversation flows they create, they create something. There aren't really any expectations, right? Um, we found that a lot of it, it, it builds identity. There's so much to gain from it. Um, we had a great artist who, um, um, she has the, um, she taught about the Mayan calendar. That was wonderful. Wow. We had some um, young girls that came to this who have um, ethnic heritage and they felt very identified and it opened up, you know, it just, it, it, it ignited this spark in them and they were, they became curious about who they are or where they come from or, you know, so, so that's what it does. That's what this opportunity really offers the, the community. And that's, that seems like it's kind of, can be unifying too because every culture does have its art and depends on its art mm -hmm. for like the vitality of the society. It does. It does. It does. It expresses. Art are really, the arts, 
build a community. If you think about it, they, they, ref they don't just reflect a history, a, a, a community itself, because they do reflect, but they also build the community. When people come together into a space like this, there aren't expectations. People come in to very open to observe and to learn and to experience, really. So that, that's, that itself, I think, is just, um, I, I think this is the whole purpose, purpose of the arts. Another program we have that is, involves the arts is um, we started it last year. It's called Act One and Act Two. It's a theater program for the youth. It was a partnership with Chestnut Street Theater and Playhouse from Norwich. It was funded by the ARPA grant from Norwich, and this program um, was very successful. It was a group of young, I think there were like eight or ten young um, men and women who, um, oh, it was a very diverse group, who um, don't, were not all bilingual. So you had, you had individuals who spoke English, solely English, only English, and had no Hispanic background at all. You had individuals who spoke both languages fluently. You had individuals who only spoke Spanish, did not speak any English. And these kids came together into a space. This was a series of vignettes. It was a comedy about the um, immigrant experience. And, um, oh my God, if you had seen this, this, this play, their experience. One of the questions at the end of, 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 the, of the, the play was, um, you know, one of the purposes, one of our purposes is to build community. Do you feel that this was, did we, do you feel that this is what we, we, we reached this goal? And the girl said, I'll be, yes. That if she had not had this opportunity to participate in this group, she would have never maybe been friends with this very special group of people. So they found something in common, and they, you know, they found a common ground, and they 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 learned so much about each other and themselves too, right? About their heritage too, because it was it was and it, the, the play itself talks about the diversity within the Hispanic community, which is of Cubans and Puerto Ricans and different groups. So it was really it was it was funny, it was hilarious to hear it. So um, and if you understood both languages, you were more you know it, it was even better. Right? But I think that whomever didn't speak Spanish still was able to enjoy it, and whoever didn't speak English was able yeah. to enjoy it because it went back and forth between both languages. So it was a great experience, and we're hoping to be yeah. able to run it again this year. That's, that's part of our plan. So, so that's a real advantage of starting to be able to do in-person things. Yes. Because yes. that sounds like an experience that would not have been the same Virtually? As a virtual. <laughs> no way. <laughs> no. No, no, no. <laughs> so, and at the risk of being repetitive, anyone who, people who are interested in participating in any of your programs should just get in touch with you. Yeah, it's just go on our website and, and, and send us an email. Now, Brija program is opening, um, the applications are open right now, and um, the community, the, the, the youth, the rising juniors can just enroll, apply for it. Since some of our programs are limited in the numbers that we can serve, um, we do ask for an application process. We do have an application process for it. So such as, you know, programs such as Brija and um, the Act One and Act Two program, you know, they do require to apply. Now, listening to you, some of the programs were focused more on girls and young women. And um, is that, was that intentional? Is that a, a, a group within the Hispanic community that has been lacking access to power, even in you know at home? <laughs> I I think that okay. So yes, um, I would say that um, the timing when 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 these programs were created, right, and were 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 thought initially they were thought um, they were thought created by women. Right, for women, right, and 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 during this time, it was definitely a very, it was a need, right. Um, when 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 you immigrate to this country, um, there are many 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 changes that happen in your in your life, right. A lot of these households, uh, these couples that come here, back 
home or back where in their native country, maybe the woman didn't have to work or she didn't work, right? And she was very much focused to taking care of the children in the household. And, but by coming here, it's not really financially, right. it's, it's not something you can do. You gotta go out no, there No, 50 and work. years ago, maybe. Maybe, but not, but not anymore. <laughs> not anymore. So yeah, so there, there's this huge need to, an understanding of now the woman, there is this huge understanding of um, needing to grow and in, 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 other, in other spaces, right? Um, and a lot of these women have to go out there and work. Some of them don't come with a, an education to support right. them, right? Like a degree or, you know, a lot of them, like I was explaining to you earlier, sharing the story, don't even come with a, a high school degree, right? But that doesn't mean they're less interested in, 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 in doing the work or, or, or and, and they understand clearly what they want for their own children, right? Their dreams and their goals are very clear. So these two programs were really created to empower the, these women that wanted and had these, have these very clear dreams and goals, but the resources are not there for them, right? Not, not because there aren't resources available, because they have certain limitations or gaps, right, that on, they come with um, from their own country. So I find that um, we've learned that they become inspired. It's an opportunity to be inspired. And then they see themselves different too. Yeah, right? When they see that someone else that comes from the same experience or a shared experience has reached those goals, now they see possibility in them. And that's what we offer. I mean, that sounds really interesting, starting to make a transition from seeing your role within a family to your role within the greater community. Within the greater community, exactly, exactly. Understanding that now, and, 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 and emotionally, I think it also is, there's a lot of stress, there's a lot of anxiety, there is a lot of wanting to do a lot of things. You have a lot of these ladies that are working two jobs, but are coming home, cooking, cleaning, taking care of the household, you know, it's just, there is a lot of, they have a lot on their plates. Um, the Latina Network offers that space to kind of separate themselves from all of this. And, or, or just be able to talk about it and realize that it's a shared experience. There are many more women out there facing the same um, situations and, you know. So we only have a few minutes left, actually, only getting the five minute warning. Um, but I wanted to ask, you know, I've been, you mentioned healthcare, and I have been supportive of a lot of initiatives and legislation mm -hmm. to expand healthcare access. And one of the things that, that's been somewhat successful in, in Connecticut is expanding Husky, Husky. to um, the undocumented community. And I was kind of wondering within Hispanic Alliance um, if there are special needs of the undocumented community that you feel like you can support. Yes, so I love your question because we actually, um, with the support of um, the Connecticut Health, Health Foundation, we're going to be offering um, information throughout, through workshops. Um, where um, we're going to give in, in, in Spanish and as clear and simple and, 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 and the information about these changes, um, the insurance eligibility for um, the children and the importance of providing um, um, information to Husky so they don't lose coverage because a lot of the people moving back and forth are going to lose this and so making sure that they understand that you, right now during this time frame you need to provide current information you need to send out your income or whatever you need to do um, there are certain needs or certain um, aspects of, of the Husky application and the process that can be complicated and difficult to understand and we're going to provide support with that so we're going to run these workshops once a month and we're going to, um, after the workshop, people are going to be, a, we're gonna, they're gonna schedule an appointment with one of our program coordinators and we're going in our interns and we're gonna provide the information they need and the guidance in the application process. Well, great. So in the last 
like two minutes that you have, uh, just remind people how to get in touch with you if they're interested in any of the kinds of programs you have. So the, the best way uh, and most effective way is through our website. Um, our, you can write an email to us, contact us under contact. Our website is www.hispanicalliancesect.org. You go on our website, it allows you to change between languages, so you can go back and forth between both languages, and just send us an email and express what program you're interested in, what need do you have. Um, it's just gonna require very basic information and we will respond to that email, um, offering whatever connection or resources they may need. And you're located right on State Street. We are located right on State Street. And you, ha you have two separate spaces, is that correct? The gallery space and the office space? Yes, yes we do, right there on, on, on State Street. So thank you so much. Uh, next week, we're kind of going to continue to uh, focus on some local nonprofit organizations. Uh, and Trina Charles from Step Up New London is going to be the guest and talk about what Step Up is up to these days. So um, thanks again. Thank you, and Anna. Good thank you luck. very much. Thank you. Thank and you. Uh, we'll see you around New London over the summer. Yes, hopefully. we will. <laughs> yes, we will. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.